has allowed us to be able to be here. We're thankful the Lord has given us this nice warm place. Uh, we're thankful for the visitors that we have this morning. Most of all, uh, we're thankful for salvation. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed our unworthy souls. We didn't deserve it. And there wasn't anything we could do to earn it. And yet he showed grace and he showed mercy. And we're so thankful for that. We sang that song at Calvary. Um, it's very much uh, uh, an example of, of mankind and how we are. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. People have to come to that recognition of their sinful condition. They have to come to that recognition of knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done and how he died for their sins and we are so thankful that the Lord has sent people into our lives to tell us that message and uh, that the Lord moved in our hearts and opened our eyes to the things we need we sung the song hide thou me uh, what an encouragement for the person that's been saved person to know the promises of God that he is with us sometimes I feel discouraged and think my life in vain I'm tempted then to murmur and of my lot complain but when I think of Jesus and all he's done for me, then I cry, rock of ages, hide thou me. This life has some pretty rough things in it. We're going to go through some stuff we don't understand. Uh, we're going to go through, through some things that we're going to question and we're going to wonder, Lord, what, what are you trying to teach me? Uh, but the times we feel the most discouraged, just remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has already done for you. Uh, and when you, I, I don't know about you, but me, when I start to get frustrated, when I start to get overwhelmed, I start to think, I don't know what's going on. Just thinking back to what the Lord has already done for me and what he's provided for me and how he has taken me from that worthless lost sinner and adopted me as a son. Uh, if that doesn't boost your spirits, I don't know what will. So appreciate those songs this morning. Uh, Brother Philip, in that last one, he leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. You know, he's promised that he's with us. He's promised that he will give us peace. Those are some of the things that we've talked about in these chapters leading up to where we are now. And uh, it's just a good reminder. We, we, we understand as we go over the ne these next few chapters that those things, knowing that the Lord leads us, knowing that the Lord has delivered us in the past, knowing that the Lord fulfills his promises is critical because he's about to tell the apostles in these next few chapters, hard times are coming. I'm going back, you're going to be here, but don't worry, I can provide peace whenever it doesn't seem like there can be peace. And we're thankful for those promises. Now today, what I want to do, we're going to be in the book of John, John chapter 13. Uh, we kind of went over the overview of this last Sunday, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Understand that as you're going through the book of John, the first 12 chapters of John are really dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ coming and declaring who he is. John the Baptist is saying things like, behold, the Lamb of God, right? Uh, we see the miracles of Jesus Christ. We see this debate with the, the Jewish rulers. And, and you see uh, the, 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 the blind man being healed, the lame man being healed. And finally up to this point where Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. And then the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. You see really what you're seeing here in these first 12 chapters uh, is a short recap by John of what Jesus did in his ministry publicly to declare who he was and why he had come. Chapter 13 is where we talked about you see a shift in the story. Chapter 13 suddenly turns, turns very much inward and it's very much about Jesus Christ's last few days, not, not even at this point last few days, we're really talking last few hours and he is really taking this time with his apostles, with his disciples, to teach them and to get them ready for the fact that he's about to not be here. And that's really where we're at here in John chapter 13. 
Uh, we talked about the fact uh, last uh, Sunday afternoon, we really went through and we focused in John chapter 13 about Jesus Christ's show of servant leadership. And we talked about the fact that that's a term in the business world you're going to hear a lot, right? Servant leadership. The best managers are those that are servant leaders. Many times people that talk about that don't realize that that is a principle that Jesus Christ himself taught while he was here. Jesus Christ uh, even though he was the Lord and Master, right? Even though he was the guy that they looked to as their leader, he got down on his hands and knees and he washed the disciples' feet. And when he was done, he told them, I did this as an example because if I'm the Lord and Master, I'm willing to get down and wash your feet, then don't you think you ought to be willing to do that for each other? And he talked about the fact that, look, I'm showing you this as an example I came, I'm about to die for your sins. You think about the love and the service that I'm willing to do for you. You need to be willing to do it for each other. In other words, you need to be willing to set aside your bickering and your differences and your I'm more important than you are and here's the hierarchy. No, he didn't want that. He's saying, look, you need to love each other like I loved you. Right? That was kind of what we talked about last week. Now, I mentioned that what we want to do is even though we've already covered that part of John chapter 13, there's lessons within lessons in John chapter 13. There's the bigger picture, which Jesus Christ is, is declaring to them. He's building up. He's showing them this thing that, look, you need to love each other with the same compassion, kindness, long-suffering servant's heart that I have toward you. But within that, they have some other lessons that they need to learn. So we're going to go back and we're going to take some bits and pieces here out of John chapter 13. And we're going to talk about a few other things. In doing it, we're going to have to cover some of this again. But the focus will be a little bit different. John chapter 13, starting in verse 3, says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God... He riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and gird himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never Wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not to save, wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on in these verses, and we already talked about the main thing that Jesus was doing, which was uh, as he was washing the disciples' feet, he was showing them the heart and attitude that they needed to have toward each other. But what we want to do is we want to stop for just a second, and we want to talk a little bit about what Peter does in this story, and I think some lessons that we can learn from Peter. Peter's question now, understand that I don't know Peter's motives. I can guess Peter's motives, right? But understand the fact that when the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you, if you almost picture this in your mind, right, there's, there's at least the 12. Um, I think there's some indication there may have been some other people there, but at least the 12, Jesus Christ is started already, right? He doesn't... He doesn't do this, and then he gets to Peter first, and Peter says, what are you doing, Lord? Are you going to wash my feet? It's almost as if you look at this, Peter has watched him and what he's doing, because it says that uh, he, after he poureth water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them. Then cometh to Simon Peter. He's already started. He's been down on his hands and knees washing these people's feet, uh, we don't know the other people's reactions. I would believe based on the traditions and the culture that they were in, they were in a little bit of a state of shock that the rabbi, the teacher, the one they followed had put himself in this 
lowly position. This was a position that was usually given to the lowliest person in the room, a servant or maybe a young child. And yet the Lord and Master is down washing their feet. The interesting thing is what happens when he gets to Peter. Now Peter asks a question. Peter says, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? In other words, Lord, are you, are you going to wash my feet? Now, I think Peter... Peter is a very passionate, zealous person, and he usually talks before he thinks sometimes. Um, and, and sometimes you see where it gets Peter in trouble, and other times you see where, I tell you what, Peter, Peter's just, you really just love to see Peter's reaction to things sometimes. You know, I don't know what Peter's motives were. You know, was Peter, was Peter too prideful? He didn't, you know, I'm... I don't want you down there washing my feet. Was it, was it more of a heart of, I think to some degree, Peter realized his, I'm going to use the word worthlessness in regards to who Jesus Christ was, right? In regards to, this is, this is, this is the one that came to pay for man's sins, and he's going to get down and wash my feet. And was there, it behind Peter's words, was there this thought of, Lord, you know who I am and what I am. Are you really going to get down and wash? Are you really going to get down and wash my feet? You know, there's times when we ask the Lord something <clears throat> because we really want to know the answer, right? We ask in a position of, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this is happening. I really want to know Lord, so I can, I can be what you need me to be, right? But there's also times we ask questions rhetorically, so to speak. Is it possible that Peter was asking this question, really didn't want to know the answer, right? Was it a rhetorical question? Lord, are you going you gonna to wash my feet? Because that's not happening. There's some indication that may have been it, because later on when the Lord answers him, he says, that's never, never, Lord. You're not washing my feet. Sometimes we ask the Lord from the place of, Lord, I, I truly want to know what's happening. But I'm afraid sometimes we ask the Lord our questions more in this attitude of, this can't be it. And it's really not meant to be, Lord, I want to know more. Lord, I want to know so I can be closer to you. It's... Lord, surely this is not what you have planned. You know, I've heard people say that you shouldn't ever question the Lord. You shouldn't ever question God. I don't actually believe that. Um, I think as you look through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you're going to find times where in some of people's deepest, darkest places, they cry out to God for an answer. Lord, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know. It's okay to ask God why. It's okay to ask God what his plan is. Lord, open my eyes. You see that over and over and over in the Psalms. Lord, I don't understand this. Please open my eyes that I might see this. So I want you to know that I don't think Peter necessarily asking, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Lord, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I don't know that that in and of itself is wrong, but I think Peter probably came from a place of he already knew what his answer was going to be, and his answer was going to be, you're not doing this. You know, personally, I think, I think too many times that's where we are too. When we say why, our why is not coming of a place from a place of Lord, why is this happening? Please show me. It's coming from a place of why would you do this to me? How dare you do this to me, right? What why? There's no way you're gonna let this happen, right? We just need to be careful with when the Lord starts to move in our life and the Lord starts to do things, it is okay to go to him 
and ask him for clearness. Ask him to show you. But my encouragement would be to go with a right attitude and heart of, Lord, I know you're in control. But Lord, I need, I need to know what your plan is. I need, to, I, I need help. I need understanding, right? My word of caution would just be, make sure that you're going to the Lord with the right heart and the right attitude, and you're not going with, it's a rhetorical question, and I already know what my response is going to be. You know, I find it interesting that the other thing we want to talk about here is that Peter asked a pretty direct question, and the Lord really, he didn't give Peter probably the direct answer that Peter wanted, right? Peter, Peter saying, I, I don't know what you're doing, Lord. I, I don't know why you think you're going to get down and wash my feet. Uh, understand that the way the Lord responded to him, when the Lord answered this, he says, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. You know, if you think about that sentence the Lord is basically saying here, look, Peter, I've started this very visual example for you. I'm not done yet. Let me finish. And when I'm done, you'll know why I'm doing it. I mean, that's, that's in essence what he said. What I do, thou knowest not now. Look, Peter, I know you don't understand this right now. But you will. You will. Thou shalt know hereafter. You know, sometimes when we ask a question, the Lord provides that very clear and specific answer, right? You've, you, I, I think all of us have probably had those times where something's going on and, and we call out, we cry out to the Lord for, for understanding or whatever. Uh, you've had those times where something just isn't working and you go to the Lord and you ask Him for help and and somehow it works the next time you try it or whatever, right? You've had those times where you get that, you get that answer right then. It's very clear. It's very specific. Here's your answer. Go do it. Those are really the ones we all want, right? Every time. That, that, that's the one we want. Lord, I ask, and you answer, and I'm happy. But, you know, sometimes the Lord just simply promises that we will have an answer at some point. Sometimes he tells us, you're going to have to wait a little bit. You don't get it now, but you will later. Those are the hard ones, because that requires something called faith. That requires us to recognize who he is, and that he is in control, and that he knows what's happening, and that he knows what's around the corner, and even if we don't get an answer right now, just trust him. That's the hard one. It requires faith. It requires patience. It requires us to listen more closely. That's part of it, right? He's telling Peter, Peter, let me do what I need to do. And if you will pay attention, you will have your answer. Patience, trust, and listening. You know, I also find that many times it takes a lot longer and we have to go through a lot of things before we get there. Now, I'm not talking about Peter at this moment because he would have the answers fairly quickly once he sits down. But, you know, sometimes in our life, when we don't get the immediate answer, we don't go out right away, and the Lord tells us, look, just, just wait. It's at those times where we're probably going to go through some stuff. But you know what I have found? That when we lean on him and we trust him and we move forward in his strength, we actually draw closer to him. We learn the lessons that he's trying to get us to learn. And in the process of learning those things, we actually lean on him more than we did. If every answer he gave us was a quick answer with all of the details and we knew everything that was coming, you know, that's not always good for us. You know, there's sometimes when I need my kids 
I can't explain the whole thing, and maybe even if I tried, they wouldn't get it. I need them to go through it. Follow me. And when they're done and they look back, our relationship is stronger. And they've learned some things they probably wouldn't have learned if I just sat down and told them A, B, C, D. They have to see it. They have to feel it. They have to experience it. And sometimes that's the way the Lord answers us. And that's what we see here to some degree is he tells Peter, What I do now thou knowest not but thou shalt know hereafter. You know, Jesus Christ, in, in this story, right, Jesus is telling Peter, you don't understand yet, but if you'll listen, you will. You know, Jesus could have done something different. Peter didn't understand why the Lord and Master would humble himself so much that he would get down and he would wash his feet. Jesus could have stopped what he was doing. Jesus could have stopped what he was doing and he could have looked at Peter and he said, well, I've done enough. I've washed these people's feet. I haven't washed yours yet, Peter, but here's why I'm doing it. He could have said, hey, look, Peter, you guys need to be willing to bend over backwards for each other. I'm about to go back to be with the Father and it's critical that you learn to treat each other like you need to treat each other. You need to be willing to sacrifice and to love each other. It's going to be easy for you guys to fall into a pattern of who's higher than who else and you start to lord it over other people. I've already seen that argument from you guys in the past. So this is why I'm doing it. He could have absolutely done that, but he didn't. He said, Peter, you don't understand now, but you will. Sit down. I think about, I was reading a little bit, and I, 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 Gideon in the Old Testament, right? Of course, he did all the things where he wanted this, he wanted this sign, and he wanted that sign, and the Lord did it, right? It, the Lord did it. The Lord kept answering his, here, here, Gideon, I'll show you, I'll show you. Gideon actually had a pretty big army. You know, what the Lord could have done with Gideon was said, go, Go over here to this water and see who does this and who does that and take all the people that do it this way and keep them and send everybody else home. I'll tell you later why. The Lord didn't actually do that. The Lord actually told Gideon, you've got too many people and if you win this battle with this many people, Israel's pride will be lifted up and they will think they've done it. I want you to go do this and whoever does A and whoever does B, you send the people that do B home and you keep the people that do A. He told Gideon why he was doing what he was doing before he actually did it. Sometimes that's what the Lord does. Sometimes the Lord says, Peter, just listen. I'll show you. Just be patient. But it's interesting as you look at the Lord's answer and he says, You don't know now, you don't understand now, but you will. And then in verse 8, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. What started out as a question, and whether Peter started off with the right attitude or not, he ended up in a bad place. Right? Peter said, are you going to wash my feet? Me? The lowly fisherman? The sinner? This worthless guy? You are Lord and Rabbi? You are Master? Are you going to wash my feet? And when the Lord said, Peter, just trust me, you'll, fit, you'll, learn, you'll learn a lesson in a minute. Peter's response was one of basic, even though it may have come from a, 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 what seemed like a place of, Lord, you're too important to do this. It may have seemed like it was coming from a place of reverence for God. He was actually openly defiant to what the Lord Jesus Christ was asking him to do. He looked at his Lord and Master, and again, may have had every heart and attitude of saying, 
you deserve more honor than to get down and wash my feet. But his reaction ended up being one really of disobedience. It turned into this thing of, you know, I would almost classify it to some degree as pride. I mean, it, it seems like it's the opposite of pride because he's saying, Lord, you're too important to do this. But understand that when the Lord has said, look, Peter, this is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. When Peter continues to debate it, when t Peter continues to refuse he is in some ways putting himself above his Lord and Master's wishes. And he's saying, no, no. I, in essence, what Peter is saying is, I know better than you do. How many times we need to be careful when we go to the Lord and we start with this rhetorical question of, why are you doing this to me? And the Lord tells us, just be patient or just trust or here's what I'm going to do. And our response comes back as, this is not right. It can't be this. No, I don't think so. Be careful that your attitude doesn't turn into one of just open disobedience to the one that you say that you serve. Be careful that your heart and attitude and your desires don't turn into this concept of, I know what's good for me, Lord, and it's not what you're saying. And it's in essence where Peter was at. Now, Peter's going to be, uh, we're going to see some interesting things from Peter here in a little bit. Now, you may feel like I'm kind of beating on Peter a little bit. Understand that I, P Peter's a guy that I love to read about in the, in the, in the New Testament. He's just so zealous and, and passionate about serving the Lord. But is also his mouth sometimes get ahead, gets ahead of, of, his, of his brain sometimes, I think. You see here this idea of, you know, I know better, I know, Lord. And he starts to push back. And he really crosses a line, in my opinion, of going from a simple question to, again, all, really just almost outright disobedience. And we want to be careful that we don't do that. You know, the Lord tells Peter, as he keeps going here, he says, uh, when Peter says, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. This idea here, um, despite the fact that Peter thinks he's honoring the Lord, he's really disobeying him. He's, he's in a lot of ways, right, creating a, a rift in the communion, in the relationship between him and the Lord. And the Lord is saying, Look, Peter, if you... if if you can't follow me, if you, if you can't lay aside your pride, you're in essence saying, you have no part with me. If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, I think there's multiple things going on here. We can talk about the physical aspect of what's going on and, and the Lord literally meaning, look, Peter, if you, if you won't let me wash your feet, if you, if you are going to lift yourself up so much that you won't lift your feet, then then you've broken the communion between us. You've, you've got no part with me. You're not willing to follow me. There might be some spiritual reference here um, in regards to, I, I've read a lot of people and a lot of people feel that the Lord is shifting gears here and he's actually talking about if you've not been washed, if your sins have not been washed away, then you have no part with me. I can see where people would come to that. I, I don't know that I jump there just yet. Um, I do think that as we get down to some of these other verses, the Lord does change gears. I think to some degree here he's saying, Peter, look, if, if you won't let me do this, you, you're, you're breaking the relationship here, right? You're, you're saying you don't have any part with me. I love... Peter's response, even though the Lord comes back and says, well, look, Peter, that's not necessary. I, I do love Peter's response because imagine this, imagine this guy, he's watching his friends get their feet washed by the Lord and Master. And, and if you know Peter, you can almost feel the tension building in him. And he's just, this, no, this is not going to happen. Lord, are you going to do that to me? Lord says, you just need to wait, Peter. Just be patient. You'll learn the lesson here in a minute. 
And he says, no, you're not doing this. And the Lord says, look, Peter, if you don't let me do this, then you have no part with me. And Peter, you can almost see, I mean, when Paul, Peter's zeal and passion for the Lord is very strong. And, and you see this, the, the, the Lord wants to wash his feet. And the Lord, if Peter, if you won't let me do it, I'm, I, you're going to have no part with me. And man, it's like, a, it's like a switch gets flipped in Peter's head. And Peter says, Lord, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my head. You, just wash my whole body if you want to, right? Because I want... I want that communion with you. I want to be, uh, I want to be with you, Lord. I want to be by your side. I want that relationship with you. It's just, just wash me all over. Elliot, me and you talked last week, right? You, I see you took your socks off again. You really like taking them socks off when I'm talking about washing people's feet, don't you? You know what? It'd be like Elliot last week. Elliot's like, mm -mm, I ain't washing my feet. I saw his face when I started talking about washing feet. But you know what happened? It's like as if Elliot would have went from, you ain't touching my feet, to, to just wash my head, wash my hands, wash my feet. If that's what you want, Lord, then that's where we're going. You got to love that. You got to love that response from Peter. Now, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord takes it as an opportunity to kind of shift the conversation and, and to teach him a few things. But as much as I've talked about how Peter was maybe not having the right heart and attitude, you do realize when you see Peter's response that there was nothing more important to Peter than having a relationship with the Lord. Lord, I want that relationship. I want that relationship to be close. And if you tell me that what I need in order for that relationship to be what it needs to be, that you need to wash my feet, then wash my hands and wash my head. Lord, just wash me all over. <laughs> you got to love Peter's responses to things. But I want you to also look at a few things here. Jesus turns the conversation, I believe it's at this point that Jesus Christ turns the conversation to more of a spiritual thing. I mean, it, it's spiritual the whole time, right? I mean, he's talking about how that they need to have that servant's heart, how they need to love each other, uh, how they need to be willing to follow him. But I do think that when we get here to this next verse that there is some important differences. As you look in verse 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now there's really two things that are going on here. Really, I guess I could say three things that are going on in these two verses. Jesus Christ is about to start talking about the one that's going to betray him. This is really the first part uh, in, in this chapter, right, where he starts to talk about I'm, I'm talking to you guys, but not all of you. There's one of you that's not what he's supposed to be. That's really the first entrance to that topic at this point. It's going to come up a couple times here in the rest of this chapter. So that's one thing that's going on. But I also want you to recognize Jesus Christ is drawing a very physical example to draw a very spiritual point. And he has, how many times has he done this in the book of John? So many times he talks about the springs of living water and they think physical. And he says, no, I'm talking spiritual. I'm the bread and they think physical. And he's saying, no, you need to think spiritually. Right? Being born again. I'm not talking physically, Nicodemus. I'm talking spiritually. Right? So I want you to think about this. First off, we're going to talk about the physical application of what he's talking about. Peter has just, understand from a practical perspective, we talked about this last time, right? They didn't travel like we do, and they didn't wear the same type of footwear that we do, and they weren't necessarily as clean sometimes as we are, right? Um, livestock all over the place. They didn't have necessarily, in a lot of these places, they didn't have the septic system or the, the, the sewage system, and, and sometimes the, some of that stuff just got thrown out in the alleyway or it nasty sometimes right 
you show up to a meal at somebody's house and the servant of the house or the, the, the young child in the house is going to wash your feet because they need it, <laughs> right? There's some, there's some practical physical application to what's being done. Jesus Christ, uh, and it's a little hard to see this sometimes, uh, and I'm careful how I say this, it's a little hard to see this sometimes when, when you read the, 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 the King James, the, the English version of this, he that is washed needeth not to save, wash his feet, but is clean every whit. First off, I want you to know that that word washed is not the same word as the word wash. When you look at the original language, he that is washed, uh, that actually means bathed. The, the word there is to actually like to take a bath or to be fully bathed, right? So as you think about that, the idea is Jesus Christ is saying, look, if you've been washed, if you've been washed clean, if you've been completely washed, the word is talking about your whole body, you need not save wash his feet, but is clean every whit. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, if you've been washed, the only thing that you've got left to do, Peter, is to have your feet washed. That's the only thing. Is, I don't need to wash your head, Peter. Now, again, I, I don't think that that's what Peter's... That is the real-life practical statement. That's the physical picture that the Lord is showing him. I don't think the Lord Jesus Christ is simply telling him, look, you already took a bath, Peter, so the only thing you need to wash is your feet. That's the picture he's giving him. But I think there's a spiritual application there. He's saying, look, Peter, you've been washed. You're clean. The only thing I need to do is wash your feet. You need to have some renewing. There's this idea, I think, here, and I don't know how far I take this. I've seen some people that take it a lot further than I do. But I think there's an application here in regards to, Lord, Peter, you've been washed. You've been made clean. And as you... And as you travel through this world, you're going to get some filth on you. And you may need to have some renewing. You may need to have, what are we talking about? The renewing of our mind and, and some of that, right? But the Lord's telling him, Peter, look, I don't need to wash your whole body. I've already washed you. But understand, not all of you have been washed. Not all of you are clean. Is the main concept here that the Lord is trying to show the fact that somebody in their group is about to be a betrayer? Somebody in their group is an imposter? No, the main thing he's talking about is the washing of feet, the attitude, the heart that we need to treat each other with, the servant leadership, that idea of, of how we love and show compassion like Jesus Christ did. But within that, he uses this discussion with Peter to say a couple things. Peter... You need to trust me, and you need to follow me. Peter, I'm going to teach you some lessons. Peter, if you're going to break this, if you're going to break this and not follow me, you have no part with me. You're already clean. You've been cleaned, but there's one of you that's not. There's multiple things that are going on in this conversation. And you see that the Lord Jesus Christ starts to take this dialogue and he starts to not only teach them the main principle that he's teaching them, he starts to teach them a few other things. And he's going to open this door to this betrayal that's coming. And so what we're going to do, we don't have time to get into it right now, but the next thing that we'll do this afternoon is we'll talk a little bit about the Lord's prophecies about two things. The one that's going to betray him and the one that's going to deny him. Okay, And there is a difference, by the way, but we will talk about Judas's betrayal and we'll talk about Peter's denial. You know, we know, we know that the Lord sometimes teaches us things. I'm afraid sometimes I'm one of those that he has to tell me multiple times because I don't figure it out the first time. I think sometimes Peter's that way, right? 
Peter's like, you're not doing this. Yes, I am. <laughs> no, you're not. Yes, I am, and here's why. And then when the light bulb comes on, Peter's like, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I'll do. We need to be careful how we question the Lord. It's okay to ask him why. It's okay to ask him for details. It's okay to ask him to open your eyes to things. But be careful that it's not just a rhetorical question. Be careful that you really do want to know why. Be careful that your questioning of why doesn't turn into open disobedience. And then when the Lord speaks, when the Lord tries to show you things, listen. Listen. Be patient. Trust Him. Follow Him faithfully. Even if it looks like you don't understand why it's happening, He may be telling you the answer's coming later. Peter, you'll know later. Just, just trust me. Right. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and stop there. I appreciate your patience as we went through some of this. There's, uh, again, I, I didn't want to, we could have easily just talked about that exchange and just kept going, but I really wanted to draw out some of those things that I hope you see in Peter that what started out over here ended up way over here in just outright disobedience. So be careful. Make sure that your heart and attitude for when you call on the Lord and ask Him why and what He's doing, that you really want to know and that you're really willing to follow wherever that answer leads. I think that's what He wanted Peter to learn. That's one of the things He wanted Peter to learn. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and uh, stop there. Brother Philip, if you would, come and lead us in a song, please.